you can't underestimate how deeply influenced Australia was by the Wesleyan revivals in England. Those two things are actually very linked. I mean, the people who sent, you know, the people who recruited Richard Johnson onto the First Fleet were those who were deeply influenced by the evangelical revivals. Well, hello and welcome to the Great Southland Revival podcast series. Uh, I want to welcome the audience, but also give a very special welcome to our guest, Carl Fays. Kurt, great to be with you and great to be with you, the Great Southland audience. A wonderful opportunity and good to share with you. I really appreciate your time today, Carl. We, uh, for those who are not quite aware of where we're going with this series, Beginning at the start of this year, we actually began uh, interviewing people who have been historians, authors, researchers, pastors, who have looked at the topic of revival specifically in Australia. And the book has recently been published, and Carl Fays was generously one of our endorsers, um, someone who wrote a yeah, glowing endorsement for the book. And so we are actually continuing the series now that it's published with a number of other people from around Australia, Christian leaders who have a fairly good grasp of Christian history in this country and also revival history. And Carl Fays is one of those. So that's the reason we're here today. For those who don't know Carl, I actually imagine a lot of people will know who Carl is, but in case anyone doesn't, I thought, Carl, we might start with your personal and professional background. If you could just give us a bit of a sketch of that picture. Sure. Uh, I'm married uh, and have uh, three, three adult children and six grandchildren at last count, which is pretty exciting. Uh, my Professional background, if I could put use those terms, uh, um, started in church ministry very young and uh, have worked uh, from, from my early 20s in a local church work. Uh, ended up pastoring a church in Sydney, uh, in the Sutherland Shire, which is the south part of Sydney, uh, near the coast, near Cronulla. And the church is called Guy Mere Baptist. Guy Mere is a suburb. And uh, I ran that for about 20 years. Uh, but in, in that time at Guy Mere, I actually mm, dabbled in media is probably the best way to say it. And then at, toward the end of my time, just around 2013, 2014, just uh, my wife and I just felt a real call of God to step out of local church leadership, very passionate about the local church, but stepping out of leading a local church and into uh, media ministry. And so we do radio, uh, television series, documentaries, books, etc. all aimed at resourcing the local church to be more effective in evangelism and mission across Australia. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carl. There is a perception in Australia that uh, this nation is secular and that it always has been secular and that it likely always will be. What are your thoughts on this? I ask this question, Carl, because some of the documentaries you've just mentioned really sort of drill down into that question. So what is your reaction to that, that perception of Australia as being secular? Yeah, and it's intriguing that somebody asked me recently a similar question, Kurt, where they said, why do people say that? And, and I think it's partly a rewriting of history because they want to take Christianity out of the public square within Australia. And one of the ways of doing it is to suggest that it's never been there. And yet, um, and I guess I've bought into that over the years. And, and yet, you, if you have a look at uh, Australia's history, if you read some of the, the great work that's been done by Stuart uh, Piggin and Robert Lidner or uh, Roy Williams or Meredith Lake, um, all these people have written, written about the influence of Christian faith and people of Christian faith on this nation. And he, here are four just really quick things. Uh, people are very nervous as soon as you say four. It's got, it sounds like a long sermon, Kurt. Let me make this quick. There is a theory that Australia was actually settled as an evangelical experiment not just a penal colony, because who was being sent at the beginning and and some of the thinking behind it by people who ran the CMS and those in the Clapham sect in England, this idea that what if you put Christians right at the beginning, right at the very start of a nation, what if you put gospel-minded Christians, what difference would it make? So there's this concept of that that was an influence right from the beginning. People like the very first Christian leaders within this, the nation who were sent as representatives, people like Richard Johnson and Samuel Marsden and William Cowper and others, they came not as kind of uh, 
religious people. They came as gospel-minded missionaries looking to plant the gospel in this nation from the beginning. And they had a huge influence. Now, Samuel Marsden gets a bad rap, and it's, it's probably deserved in places. But in many ways, he was enormously influential. Then you see the early governors, and you'll note that the, some of the early governors, like Lachlan Macquarie or... or, or uh, um, Charles Latrobe in in Victoria, uh, who wasn't that technically a governor, but he had that that role. And also Richard Burke in the 1836 Church Act. These were Christian people, not all evangelical. Um, Richard Burke was quite a high churchman, but saw that church, faith, belief was important. And if it was it was it was going to it was going to make a difference, then the government and the governors had to help support that which they did and then if you look in the 19 if you, if you look at the 19 um 50s so ken ken english in the 1950s wrote in the current affairs bulletin and i think it was in 1958 and he, he was no no religious person no person of faith but he basically said if you look at australia in the 1950s on sheer weight of numbers just on numbers you would have to say that this is a christian nation so what he's saying is the number of people who attended church were linked to church, who called themselves Christians in the census, 96% of people in the 1950s still ticked a Christian box that didn't change to basically the 1970s. So the evangelical experiment, which most people would go, oh, that's ridiculous, that didn't work. In the 1950s, you would have to say that it looked like it worked. And so here's this notion that it wasn't, it wasn't actually secular. There was enormous influence by, by people of faith in this nation. And part of it is a, an attempt to rewrite the story to create a new narrative. And we need to push back against that. Mm, great thoughts, Carl. I, I love some of those, uh, yeah, just those themes you brought out about the early chaplains and the early governors. I made some fascinating discoveries myself, very much in line what, with what you've um, shared today. So, uh, and they're in uh, great, great Southland revival. Yep. So, um, fascinating insights. Now, your latest project is Faith Runs Deep. I first sort of heard about you through Jesus the Game Changer, and in fact, you came and spoke at our church in the Adelaide Hills. Uh, quite a number of years ago, and uh, and it was an awesome series. Now, Faith Runs Deep is your newest project, very similar. It's sort of a docu series, and it's aimed at, uh, I guess, you know, churches watching uh, and and you know, small groups being able to watch and, and really get a bit of better picture of Australia's Christian history. Um, for those who are unaware of Faith Runs Deep, can you just kind of tell us what what that project was all about and how it's going? Sure. So Faith Runs Deep is 12 episodes of 26 minutes. Uh, we released it in May 2022, uh, and it's going really well. It gets incredibly well received where it goes. It does do a little, some of what we just talked about then. It looks at history. We filmed, we filmed some material in England, but most of it's filmed around Australia. And while some, anybody listening to thinking, ah, oh, I'm not really into history, History is just a, a sort of a foundational underpinning. The, the basis of the series is to look at some lives that have been changed by Jesus and the difference that that's made. And we, we, have, we did more than 40 interviews. Many of those, probably the majority of them, were actually people telling their personal faith story. And so it's an inspirational. Uh, um, it's an inspirational series from that perspective. It's shot all over the country. We drive a, a, a black V8 Holden Ute around the country for for the um, for the people who are into cars. It's actually a, 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 a VF SSV 6.2 liter Holden Ute, and it's a thing of wonder and beauty, Kurt. It's a tough job, but someone <laughs> has to do it. But we want to drive an iconic car around the country to break down some of the stereotypes of you know what Christians are like, and uh, we do some interviews in the car. The car becomes a character within the series, so it's it's got that sort of. Mm -hmm travels uh, feel about it, lots of big drone shots capturing um, the out, well, not necessarily the outback, but certainly the Nullarbor, uh, outback New South Wales. And uh, it, it's a fabulous series. And it, and it looks at the difference that Jesus has made in people's lives. It, we want it to inspire Christians. But if you were to show this to people who are exploring faith or not there yet, it really it really fits into that mode because there's no cringe factor in the produ production values. You might disagree with it, but you're, you're going to be engaged with the content. And uh, it really demonstrates uh, we unearth stories of faith across Australia.
So good. I really encourage uh, listeners to check that series out. It's, yeah, yeah. Um, Really, really awesome series. Now, in your research, can I ask, what were some of the most surprising discoveries you made? I guess when I say research, I mean the interviews, yep. Um, yep. all of the preparation work behind the series. What were some of the most surprising discoveries that you made about Australia in that process? Well, it's just one of those things about the number of people that had influence that were deeply influenced by by Jesus. And so, you know, those the, some of the governors we talked about, like Charles Latrobe, first, he wasn't actually technically a governor, but let's call him a governor in Victoria, the first in that position. His father was a Moravian bishop. His brother was a Moravian uh, church uh, leader, local church leader. He studied uh, and was thinking about it and then got into um, civil leadership. And when he gets to Victoria, he actually invites Moravian missionaries who, who are quite influential. Now, all of that's a complete surprise to me. But the biggest, the biggest surprise, if I can just name one, was that, that um, I, I, we were going to do politics, Kurt. We always wanted to do something on politics. And in my naivety, I thought, well, we'll probably find you know, a fair bit in the conservative side of the political spectrum. I wonder what we'll find in the, you know, the Labor or the left side of the political spectrum. Well, I could not have been more wrong. And, uh, and I actually discovered, and we tell the story of W.G. Spence. Actually, a recent interview, I called him W.G. Grace. That's a cricketer. <laughs> W.G. Spence was a Presbyterian who came from the Wimmera area. He was a Bible-believing teetotaling, Sabbath observing, Sunday school leader in his local church. And yet W.G. Spence was actually the organized and started the Shearers Union, the Miners Union, and was pivotal in the start of the AWU. And, and you, what you realize when you do some of this work is that there was deep influence in the early part of the union movement and the Labor Party of Protestant Christians. Now, many people like me thought, you know, in the 50s, 60s, there was all that Catholic influence and it's, a, you know, this Irish Catholic influence on the Labor Party. Way before that, in the late uh, 19th century, there were, there were many key Christian Protestants that were involved. Like, for instance, Steve, uh, Roy Williams said this, take these three names, W.G. Spence, who I just mentioned, James McGowan, the first Labor Premier of New South Wales, and Andrew Fisher from Queensland uh, came from the Mining Miners Union and was the Prime Minister of Australia in the kind of early uh, 20th century three times. He said, what did those three men have in common? All three were the Sunday school superintendent in their local church before they went into politics. Now, you just think, you know, Steve Shavora talks about um, uh, in, in, a, in the late 19th century, there was a, an election and uh, there's like 20 odd uh, Labor Party. Uh, no, I think there's 31 or 32 Labor Party politicians that were voted in. Something like 25 of them were Protestants. And the Catholic Journal looked at these Protestants and said, all they are, these Labor Party members, are a bunch of Bible punches and pulpit thumpers. <laughs> when was the last time you heard Labor... <laughs> Uh, politicians being talked about as Bible punches or pulpit thumbers. Now, so why did they do all like, that? What was their motivation? I'm talking to Paul Rowe, the Outback historian about this, Dr. Paul Rowe. And he said, look, you know, people like W.G. Spence said, on Sundays, the church's job is to look after men. The rest of the week, that's what the, the labor, the, the union movement and the labor movement does. And, and as Steve Shavora said, if we were interviewing, he said, look, you know, if you... If you're a, a bunch of men and you're in a union and you wanted somebody to represent you, what would you want? Well, you'd want somebody who could read, which was not necessarily taken in those days, someone who could speak and someone who could represent you well. Mostly they were church going Protestants that were, that sat wow. in that zone. So that was one of the, that was one of the great surprising things that, that here is this influence right through the labor movement that didn't actually change till after the Second World War. <laughs> You're right, Carl, in saying that so much of Australia's history has been, I don't know if whitewashed is the right word, but certainly sort of sanitised and secularised because yep. you do just a little bit of digging below the surface and there really is so mm. much Christian influence. Absolutely. Now, the, the book that I mentioned, yeah, 
Sorry. I, I was just going to say, that doesn't mean there weren't issues. And, and I know you're not saying that. And, and one of the things that w- there is a problem with whitewashing is I feel that our job, Olive Tree Media, is, to, is, you know, there's so many people telling the bad news, Kurt. We want to tell the good news. Mm-hmm. One of the dangers is that we, we can sort of gloss over, and there's some bad stories, and there are some pretty awful stories. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there are many great stories, and they're the ones that we should tell. Absolutely. Totally agree. Now, speaking of stories, I mentioned the book at the start. I forgot to hold it up and show everyone. Great Southland Revival. That's our newest book that we've released. Um, Warwick Marsh and myself as authors. Now, um, obviously, the theme of this book is revival. And so, Carl, I'm fascinated to know in all of your uh, interviews and your trip around the country and the V8 Ute and, uh, and all of your research, did you find much on revivals in Australian history? Yeah, in fact, one of the episodes is on revivals, and that was one of the things that we started. And we, we the, if you watch that episode um, after you've read Great Southland Revivals, <laughs> and you've got hold of the book, and you re, you watch some of our series, uh, we actually opened that episode uh, in London, and I do a piece to camera at Charles Wesley statue outside Wesley House in London, and one of the points that we make is that. We, you can't underestimate how deeply influenced Australia was by the Wesleyan revivals in England. Those two things are actually very linked. I mean, the people who sent, you know, the people who recruited Richard Johnson onto the First Fleet were those who were deeply influenced by the evangelical revivals. Many of the people who actually came as missionaries, came as church leaders, or came later as free settlers, were all influenced by the UK revivals. And so you had places like, uh, and, and Stuart Piggin talks about this, and he's, you interview him, and he's just got great, great material, Stuart Piggin. But he talks about if you go to Muta and Burra, which we didn't film at, but we passed, we passed by in the Ute, and you would know them there in South yeah. Australia, Kurt. But Muta and Burra, you know, you had all these people deeply influenced by Wesleyan revivals. And in Muta and Burra, apparently there was one Catholic church, one Anglican church, and 11 Wesleyan churches. <laughs> what is that <laughs> saying? It's saying that those who came weren't involved in institutional heritage religion. They were involved in what impacted them personally, which was the Wesleyan revivals. Now, as uh as we know, um, there's, it can be said that there was only 2% or more as, uh, um, has been said that, you know, not every person and there wasn't this huge overwhelming majority of people in England who actually became Christians in the revivals, but there was enough to see that there was uh, influence. And then early in the 20th century in places like Mount Kembla in the mines, all up and down the Illawarra, massive revivals that changed uh, that community. And then if you move forward to the 50s and the 1959 Billy Graham uh, crusade where 130,000 Australians signed up that they'd come to follow Jesus. Now, it's never been talked about as a revival, but boy, it was close, deeply influential. Yeah, absolutely. Um, To drill down, I guess, a little bit deeper on that question, what I see uh, myself when I look at revival history is that it often results in fairly significant cultural reform. And uh, you might be able to speak to that a little bit in the Australian context from, you know, the research that you've done. Um, but yeah, so I, I guess I'm a bit curious about whether you've seen cultural reform, social reform as a result of revival in Australia's history. And would you also anticipate that if we had revival today, we might see the same thing again? Yeah, you'd have to say that, it, that every time there's been a revival, one of the marks that you, why you call it a revival is that there's social re- reform. Uh, there's a funny story about um, the, uh, and I think you have this in your book as well, uh, the, the coal mines in Mount Kembla, uh, that after the revival, uh, all these, these men in Mount Kembla stopped swearing and uh, the pit ponies uh, weren't sure what to do because they couldn't understand them if they weren't cursing the whole time. So <laughs> there was, a, there was a, a, a loss of bad debts at that time, like a reduction in bad debts, a reduction in alcoholism. Um, the same thing happened around the Billy Graham crusade. In 1959, there was a lot of research about what changed. There, was, it, there wasn't a decline in kind of alcoholism, but there was a flattening of a whole bunch of trends, like there was a trend in growing alcoholism, a trend in illegitimate children, 
All of those things seem to flatten off in the period of time where the, the Billy Graham uh, uh, um, crusades had that deep influence across Australia. And, and you, you, do, you do see that on an ongoing basis that there are, it's not like the whole community becomes, you know, walking saints, but there is a, there is a, there is a, a significant difference in the kind of feel of the community. Uh, and, and, and you'll see that it's certainly Robert Lindner and, and um, uh, uh, Stuart, Har- uh, Stuart Piggins' work actually kind of reflect that on an ongoing, on an ongoing basis. In fact, one of the people, when we talked um, in England, uh, our guest was talking about the fact that, uh, you know, he quotes Wesley where he said that, you know, in these places where there used to be riotous parties, et cetera, now all that can be heard is, is, is singing and praising as people gather in worship. So there's a really significant shift that we see. And so one of the marks of revival is not just a whole bunch of people turning up the church on a regular basis, as good as that is, but there's a change in the social fabric of the community, and that's seen in England. We've seen in 1906 in Port Kembla, uh, uh, in Mount Kembla, and that area, and it was also seen under after the Billy Graham Crusades in, in uh, across Australia. Pretty remarkable, hey? Yeah, it's awesome, awesome what God does on on that sort of cultural social front. And um, I guess, so yeah, bouncing off of that question, if we were to see revival in Australia today, hypothetically speaking, what sorts of trends do you think might flatten off or might actually drop off or improve um, just based on, you know, your picture of where things are at in Australia right now? Yeah, yeah, because that was kind of part of your last question. Um, I mean, what what I would say, I think we'll feel a bit aspirational, (laughs) You know, it's a bit like, mm-hmm. is this what I would like to see? Or this is a definite piece of research demonstrated that we would see. Um, right now, we, we have sure. we have a decreasing number of people who who identify as Christian. There's, there's actually a flat line of people going to church. The percentage has been at 15 to 16 percent actually for about 15 years. So that's actually stayed at a fairly flat line wow. and a decrease in the number of people who tick a Christian box. If there was a significant ri- revival breaking out, you would see an increase in the number of people who are willing to tick a box. I think you would see an increase in the number of people who are part of church. I think you would see, you would, I would pray and hope you would to see a decrease in the number of uh, people seeking out abortions a decrease in the amount of gambling across our community and an increase in the the way that we we serve the poor, needy and dispossessed across the community. So I think that you would hopefully see a reduction in... um, And and interesting, the whole alcohol thing is very interesting, Kurt, because one of the people we... um, Because you would sort of say, you know, that was a big decrease in the Billy Graham time or at least a flattening of it. And yet we interviewed... uh, um, uh, Andy Goulet, who runs Red Frogs, and he started now. Red Frogs, for those who don't know, these are Christian volunteers who go to places like the Gold Coast, Byron Bay, uh, where there's where there's end of year schoolies. They now do lots of other things now, but let's just stay with that. And basically, they go there as kind of street chaplains, as a way, and they just they're just there to help people make sure they're safe. Now, Andy Goulet said when he started that alcohol is uh, the, the over abuse of alcohol was enormous. He said there's been quite a change. They're, they're not nearly as uh, as focused on uh, the abuse of alcohol now. So there's there's almost like this new this next generation that already changed. But you would like to see a reduction in the abuse of alcohol and the reduction in the abuse of of, uh, of, of drugs and illicit practices. You would love to see an increase in hope and therefore a decrease in those taking their lives. We, we both know that young, mm. young men take basically the, the thing that kills most men under about the age of 50 is them doing damage to themselves. That's a horrible statistic. Mm. And you would hope mm. that with a greater sense of purpose, of being loved, of a future held in God's hands, that it's not that it would disappear, because we do know there are still those who struggle with anxiety and depression, but that that God would break into those spaces as well. It wouldn't mean Australia would be, you know, a a walking paradise in every area, but there would be an influence in those spaces as people come to know Jesus and change their future and their behaviour.
Mm. Yeah, it is fascinating because revival is is always a divisive thing. Uh, we look back and we see so many great cultural changes, and they are very real historically speaking. You know, a lot of mm. improvements take place in in the revivals that we can study. But at the same time, that doesn't mean, like you said, doesn't mean the country becomes perfect. Doesn't mean everyone's on board with what happens. Um, there's obviously division and difference, and and people who who remain unaffected by it. Uh, but absolutely, it's the case that when revivals come, uh, you know, there is huge so- social and cultural change, which is really one of the reasons that Warwick and I were motivated to yep. to write Great Southland Revival. Now, coming back to the book, you've had a chance to read it, Carl. You gave us a glowing endorsement. We're very thankful for that. Would you recommend the book and why? Well, absolutely. And uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, while it has academic rigor, it's easy, it's accessible, it's easy to read. Uh, and and in, in this space, if, if we go back to the first question you asked me, which was, you know, has, you know, has Australia always been secular and, and et cetera, how do, we, how do we respond to that? Well, the, the way to respond to it is to tell a new story, to tell a new narrative. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as I've said, when we we'd launched the, the Great Southland Revival and as I've been saying to lots of people lately, um, when we get together as families, when we get together as friends, what do we do? Well, we tell stories. And the reason we tell stories is because they contain values and they actually tell us about what's important. If you think about when you get together as a group of friends, a group of colleagues or a family, it's almost like it'd be interesting to anal- analyse the stories that people tell. And what does that say about the values that you hold? Now, what? so that's true of families and communities. It's also true of a nation. And what we need is a new set of stories. What we need is to, to demonstrate the narrative of the influence of Jesus that, that's been here from the start, that it's not something that we're sort of imposing on a nation. It's almost discovering the foundation, the foundational values of who we are as a nation. And I, I think if we can, and what what uh, Great Southland Revival does is it tells a set of stories that we need to hear and we need to know. And so if, and, and especially if you're thinking as you, as, as you listen to Kurt and I speak and you're thinking, oh gosh, you know, I'm depressed where the church is at. I'm depressed of the, the secular push in the nation. I'm de- depressed with, with identity politics. I'm depressed with all of that stuff. What you need is a new story. What you need is what's been happening. And this book will give that to you and it'll give it to you across a scope of history, give you some perspective, and give you some hope. Worth a read. Thanks so much, Carl. Appreciate those words. Now, before we finish up, is there anything else you'd like to add to, I guess, all of our conversations we've had about Faith Runs Deep, Great Southland Revival, Australia's Christian history? Anything I've missed? Nothing you've missed other than to to kind of re-hit a theme that I think is really important. Uh, Revival doesn't happen, influence doesn't happen unless the gospel is preached. The gospel and, and, the, and the message of Jesus is not just a humanitarian cause. As much as humanitarianism and, and the gospel as deed is important, and we should be doing it. The trouble is, in many spaces in today's world, fearful of the pushback, what the church has become is just another humanitarian organization. And as good as that is, it's not going to bring revival. It's not going to change um, lives eternally. And there needs to be a heart change, not just a hand out. And and the only way that's going to happen is if we preach the gospel, if we talk about Jesus, is if we speak about what it is that the gospel is about. It's about, yes, helping people with in, in a gospel of deed, but it's also about a gospel of word. And so my last word, my, my wrap-up comment would be, find your passion for the gospel again, because that is what's going to change our nation. That is an awesome word, Carl. Thanks again so much for taking the time out to chat to me today. And uh, yeah, just really appreciate your time. And thank you to the audience, all the people who have been listening. I encourage you to watch this, share it. um, Yeah, get the word out on social media. Um, And yeah, thanks again, Carl. Really appreciate you joining me today. Absolute pleasure, Kurt. Thank you. 